Hey everyone, this is an interview with Thomas Bjorkman. Thomas is a Swedish businessman, entrepreneur and philosopher. So Thomas recently released a book called The Nordic Secret, looking at how the Scandinavian countries went from being the poorest in Europe at the turn of the century to being some of the wealthiest and happiest at the end of the century. And he found that they basically instituted a system of folk high schools that a large proportion of the population went to. And what they taught was effectively self-development, creating an inner compass. And Thomas's perspective is that something like that is desperately needed right now to deal with the pace of change. That it's not more information we need, it's more ability to navigate and more ability to steer in this strange new world. So Thomas, we've known each other quite a long time. You're a philosopher and social entrepreneur. We share a real interest and passion for developmental thinking, systems change, and also kind of the deep stories of society. You've written about those in various books, including the world we create. And for full transparency, you were also an early investor in Rebel Wisdom. And you wrote a book about Bill Dung and how that transformed the Scandinavian society. I think it's worth just recapping the, the, the basics of that, because I think it's a really great model for understanding how um, different people have gone through these major transitions in the past and actually thrived as a result of it. Mm. So the book uh, that um, I've written together with my friend and uh, colleague, uh, the Danish philosopher and uh, writer Lena Andersen, uh, is called The Nordic Secret. What we are trying to uncover in, in the book is political and, and uh, history of ideas of the Scandinavian countries that is not generally very well known, not, not even in, in Scandinavia. Mm. And uh, um, it's all about uh, the, the fact that uh, I think we could say that the Nordic countries manage this transition from a pre-modern society into modernity better than any other um, uh, societies um, we know of. Uh, now I'm the first one to, to say that we are losing a little bit of this, but what we did a hundred years ago was actually astonishing because at the end of the 1800s, all the Nordic countries were amongst the, uh, the poorest, uh, non-democratic agrarian societies in Europe. Uh, at the end of the 1800s, 30% uh, of the working population in Sweden, for example, emigrated mainly to the US because uh, uh, of terrible living conditions. People were just like in, in um, um, Ireland at the same uh, time, were, were, were starving. And then just a few generations later, uh, all the Nordic countries were at the top of the list of the richest, the happiest, most stable uh, industrial democracies. And the question is, what uh, facilitated that transition? And of course, there are many reasons for that. But one reason that has been mainly forgotten in, in history uh, is the fact that we had very visionary intellectuals and politicians in all the Nordic countries back then. And they actually knew that in times of rapid societal change, and they saw both industrialization and urbanization coming, so they knew that we would have to prepare for rapid social change. So in these times of turbulence, it's just so natural for us humans to want to have an outside authority to hold on to. So that could be a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But these intellectuals, at least in Sweden, were, were many, mainly non-religious, even atheistic, uh, and they certainly did not want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to build democracy and they knew that the only way to build democracy was to build it from bottom up. So with today's language, we could say that what they wanted to do was that they wanted to uh, uh, facilitate for enough many people in the population to create a critical mass of conscious co-creators of modernity. 
that actually had come that far on their own inner personal development that they have gone from the state that we would today call that we are operating from a socialized mind where we are mainly dependent on outside uh, confirmation and guidance for our for our values and direction to actually internalize our values and find our inner compass and be grounded enough in ourselves not to be dependent on outside authority today we would say that that is the shift in professor robert keegan's language from a socialized mind to a self-authoring mind and how they did this is quite extraordinary. So what they actually did was that they created what perhaps could best today be described as retreat centers. And they did this all over Scandinavia and on a massive scale. So at the end of the 1800s, year 1900, there were a hundred retreat centers established in Denmark alone, 75 in Norway, and 150 in Sweden, where young adults in their early 20s, later on with full state subsidy, could spend uh, six months in retreat with the main aim of uh, developing this self-authoring capacity to, to be able to become conscious co-creators of modernity. And when this was at its height, almost exactly 100 years ago, then um, actually 10% of each young generation had the possibility to participate in, in one of these half-year-long uh, uh, retreats. And of course, that created some sort of critical mass, especially since these 10% were not just sort of located in some small elite in society in its own bubble, um, these 10% came from all different walks of life. Uh, many uh, middle, middle class, but uh, the majority of the participants were actually uh, working class or had a farming uh, background. And what sort of things were they learning? So um, the thing about personal development, and you have yourself, uh, David, spoken many times on, on this ch channel about personal development and how you cannot really learn personal development, that you have to go through this sort of embodied uh, experience, I either planned in a retreat or something, or just what, what is happening to you uh, in, in life. It might be that you hit difficult circumstances in the middle of your life, a difficult divorce, your parents die, you might have a bankruptcy or, or something like that, and you really have a need to start to, to question your, your fundamental uh, assumptions. Um, so um, uh, what they did there was not so much learning. It was more trying to give the participants an embodied experience. So the, these centers, they were called folk high schools, uh, they were fairly small. They had a living community of about 40, 50, 60 participants, were often out in nature. There was a lot of reading, was a lot of singing, a lot of uh, uh, experiencing nature. But perhaps the most important part was to create a safe environment where you could actually have authentic uh, discussions about anything in, in, in life. So that, that was really the, the methodology. And I guess that is not so different from what we are doing today at, at personal development retreats, even if we do not today have the luxury usually to be able to spend six months in retreat. It's always about creating this sort of safe environment where you can actually open up, but then get enough challenge of your, your hidden assumptions, your, your uh, root metaphors, what you take for granted to uh, really start some sort of, of inner shift. I should say, say that even though the focus and the aim was on inner development, there was also a, a bit of learning. So at the same time, um, 
you did learn about new technology so that you should be able to embrace uh, modernity as it was coming and know that we as humans can actually use technology for good and bad and that we shouldn't be afraid of technology but rather embrace technology and also they the participants were given the basic tools for organizing civil society so you you learned how to uh, write an article perhaps even how to start a small civil uh, society uh, organization how to give a speech and and things like that so if we would do the same thing today it would be personal development it would be learning about artificial intelligence and automation and social media and things like that and it would also be how do you do a a, a youtube video how you uh to argue for uh, your case and how do you make uh, a, a video go viral on social media and and things like uh, like that so it was really a, a broad uh, and deep uh, program mm. and one one thing of course one could ask is so where did the these ideas come from and the interesting thing is that these ideas came from Uh, the the german idealist philosophers that wrote in the beginning of the 1800s so philosophers like um, uh, goethe schiller herder von humboldt hegel uh, these philosophers were all read in in german original by by the intellectuals in sweden because back then uh, german was the was the first foreign language and and the academic language and of course these philosophers they all reacted against the enlightenment philosophers view of our mind as a rational machine so they said that no our mind is not a rational machine our our mind is actually a organic developing system and it's the mind is not just located in in our brain our mind is embodied in the totality of our bodies and embedded in societal culture and under the development throughout life and this developmental process they gave the german uh, name bildung and they they were quite specific on how one could facilitate this bildung process and the steps of consciousness development that for example schiller and goethe uh, wrote explicitly about is very very similar to what the developmental psychologists uh, today at harvard university and other places are are finding empirically that uh, we as humans are capable of of going through given the the right uh, en- environment so one could say that the the nordic countries were were really ahead of of uh, of the time a uh, 100 years ago but as i said we are losing it a bit now and we have actually in all the scandinavian countries completely forgotten about this because after the second world war we we changed world view and uh, we um, stopped reading uh, the german philosophers we turned to the anglo-saxon world which we, we turned to oxford and and cambridge and harvard and there of course it was the enlightenment philosophers like uh, locke and descartes with again the tabula rasa the blank slate and the mind as a rational machine that was the model that was sort of dominating analytical philosophy and and other thinking so we wholeheartedly uh, imported that and uh, Uh, contributed a bit of our own positivistic thinking there as well so today we have to completely forgotten about the importance of of inner development and uh, are only interested in again the things that are are measure, measurable in a scientific or positivistic uh, perspective cool was there anything that we that we that we missed so far thomas So I could just add there that I don't see the the Nordic secret as a blueprint for uh, uh, how we how we should do this today but I certainly see it as a case study showing that this um, interest 
th that is growing right now for understanding the connection between our personal inner development and societal change. That that is not a new idea. That is an idea that ha has actually been tested at large scale in three countries a hundred years ago, and it did actually um, work. Something we've talked about before, and I really value your your perspective on is so we've we've had conversations and we're we're part of networks that talk about a more conscious society, a more developmental society, and. I, I'm interested in how much do those network or how much do those interact with um, policymakers, with people who actually have levers of power? Because you've been in this in this game for a lot longer than I have. How do you sense of where this broader conversation is? Because I get a sense sometimes it's a little bubble of people talking to themselves about all of these different models and some academics and I wonder where it where it actually intersects with with the the people who actually have kind of agency and power in in this current system. What's your sense of where the conversation is at, and what are the sort of pressure points at the moment between this kind of conversation and one that's a bit more mainstream? Yeah, I've been thinking and writing about about this for for at least uh, ten years, and I, I saw very little happening out in. Um, mainstream society, so to say, up until uh, three years ago. But um, three years ago, something started to, to happen. Uh, and th I think that um, Brexit, certainly in, in, in the UK, Trump in the US, has made a lot of people realize that uh, we are in a, in a deeper shift than um, uh, we might have thought. And up until three years ago, in any of these circles, whether you talk about financial circles or I'm, I'm engaged in, in the think tank Club, Club of Rome um, or um, in political circles, uh, the main thinking there was something along the line that um, it is a bumpy road, but we, we have democracy and we have the market. Uh, if we just give everything a little bit of time and push this and nudge it a little bit in the, in the right direction, a bit more environmental direction, then everything will sort itself out. Um, I don't hear that uh, at all any, any longer. Uh, I think there are more and more people in these circles are starting to wake up to the fact that uh, the market, at least in its present implementation, um, and democracy, at least again in its present implementation with its high dependence uh, and cohabitation with, with the commercial media and with campaign finance, that the present implementation of, of democracy does not ex actually work. And that we will have to somehow look deeper into society than we thought before. So that's the good news. The, the bad news is that depending on how deep we believe that this shift is, it might be necessary for us to um, also shift our worldview, not only shift the system. And here I think it could be useful to uh, uh, go back to and build on what Jordan Hall was talking about again during the... Uh, Rebel Wisdom uh, Festival over the weekend. Um, he was uh, elaborating there four different levels of, uh, of systems shift or systems change. So, so the first level he was talking about uh, was the shift that we've seen in society during the last, uh, say, 50 years uh, in, in the Western society. And that, that can be the, the fundamental shift that has happened in areas like uh, 
civil rights or gay marriage and, and things like that. And these are important shifts, but uh, they are not very deep looked uh, um, in perspective of, of humanity. So if we call that level one shift, then level two would be something like uh, the shift during the industrial revolution, where the whole world system more or less shifted. But still, it was not a shift in worldview. We were still sort of operating through that level two shift with, with the same worldview. So then level three, as Jordan pointed out, that, that could be then the enlightenment, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, when we 250 years ago say, really both changed the system. We went from a feudal uh, world system into a market-based uh, system. And we went from a religious dogmatic worldview into a scientific rational worldview. And that could sort of be a level three shift. And but then uh, we have a, we all have deeper levels. So a level four shift that could be, and I think Jordan was mentioning the, the the Roman Empire, the end of the Roman Empire. I think better might be to to talk about the axial shift that both Jan Verweke and, and Jordan Peterson has been um, uh, lecturing about. How important that shift was uh, for humanity when we essentially left our hunter-gathering, hunter-gatherer society, the, the society that we have, our genes have evolved to, uh, to be um, fitted with instincts to navigate and to, through written language and through the large religions, create a new worldview, but also social imaginary that made it possible for us to live in cities with tens of thousands of uh, strangers and to even form empires. So a level four shift would be the axial age shift 2,500 ye uh, years ago. And then to Jordan's four levels, I, I would want to add a fifth level because um, uh, Daniel Schmastenberger has in, in a few interviews on, on rebel wisdom been talking about that he believes that the shift that we are facing now could be uh, on the level of the shift in, in evolution, in biological evolution, when we went from single cell organisms to uh, multiple cell organisms. And uh, uh, of course, what change, depending on how deep do we think that this change that we are facing is, then of course, uh, the demand on consciousness, consciousness development, shift in the collective imaginary and all of that will be very, very different. But I think that I agree with, with Daniel that humanity is now facing a, possibly a level five shift. I certainly believe that we are right now facing one of those uh, phase shifts. Uh, the main question for me is how deep that shift uh, might be. I believe that it is at least a level three shift, meaning that it is a shift of, of equal magnitude as the uh, shift from a medieval society to modern society the shift during the Enlightenment. That will both mean that we will totally have to rebuild our society, but also at the same time shift uh, our worldview. I, I think that uh, the deeper the shift we are going through, the deeper we have to look into ourselves, into society, but also back into history. And, and, and that is why deep history is becoming so popular. Yuval Harari, Sapiens, or David Christian, Maps of Times, for example, but also deep psychology and deep uh, sociology. The deeper the shift, 
the deeper we have to look into ourselves, into society, and back into history. And it will also demand more of our inner capacities. I think we've talked many times over a couple of years about a sort of a big shift in culture and in society. And right now with, with COVID and with this sort of sense of a big systems change, I think we, we all feel that something, something is happening. It's something you've put a lot of your energy and a lot of your effort and a lot of your, 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 your money as well into, into organizations that have been looking at kind of the deep source code of society. Um, but I really want to hear um, from you because I think you bring this really interesting mix of philosophy and really deep understanding with a very practical understanding as well. You're, you're an entrepreneur, you're a businessman, you're, you're not an academic who gets kind of lost in abstractions. So where is your sense of where we're at right now in terms of this shift? Well, perhaps... Perhaps I should then start at the, at the end and at the beginning and um, talk a, a little bit about uh, a concept that I think uh, this discussion that is going on right now in, in, the, in the channel and, and in the world could, could benefit from. Uh, and, the, and that is the sociological concept of uh, collective imaginaries. Uh, just like uh, you have done in, in the channel, you have looked at psychology, and you have looked at deep psychology. You have um, brought in the, the concepts and the perspectives of, of Jungian psychology, and that's really deep psychology. And also Jordan B. Peterson has been advocating our, our need to go beyond the more shallow everyday psychology that has dominated academia uh, for the last perhaps 50 years and look even deeper into ourselves. Um, in the same way, I think we need to uh, also go back a little bit in the history of sociology and look into something that might be called deep uh, sociology. And uh, uh, looking into the very mythopoetical foundation of our uh, society. So um, Charles Eisenstein uh, recently uh, uh, wrote a Medium article where he argued that uh, the, um, uh, separate, the myth of separation is holding us right now in, in a grip. So the book I, I wrote out of banking um, was called The Market Myth. So I also had the same sort of answer as uh, Charles, that what is holding society in, in a grip is actually a myth. And um, sociology and deep sociology is actually uh, studying how these deep myths of society is creating what uh, some sociologists, like um, uh, the, the very... Uh, famous um, social scientist Charles Taylor calls in his book from, uh, I think it's 2004, The uh, Modern Social Imaginaries is the book called. And so he gives this the name, The Social Imaginaries. The French Canadian uh, so sociologist uh, Gerard Bouchard uh, in his book, social myths and collective imaginaries from just a few years ago, he really connects this concept of these deep fundamental societal myths that every society has, whether the society is aware of it or not, with this concept of the collective imaginary. Mm -hmm. so, so then what is this collective imaginary? Well, it is something that is even deeper than what we usually mean by, for example, um, uh, ideology. So ideology, we are at least partially uh, aware of. But these collective imaginaries, the major part of them, we are totally uh, unaware of. But, but still, they uh, form our society in an unconscious way, just like our own individual deep unconscious is forming the way that we 
act, uh, the social imaginaries are forming the way a society acts. And this can sound very, very um, uh, abstract, but I think it might be um, uh, clearer if I, if I give an example. So um, a, a good example of uh, a social imaginary um, is actually money. And um, if um, we look at money from an individual perspective, uh, in the modern world, we, we are equally, one could argue that we as individuals are equally dependent on air or oxygen and on money. To, to live in the, in the modern world, we need air to breathe and we need money to, uh, to survive. Um, but if we look at a collective level, there is, a, there is an important difference between money and oxygen. Because if we, um, even if we collected uh, all uh, humans and collectively decided that we do not want to be dependent on oxygen, we couldn't do anything about that natural dependence. But of course, if we gathered all of humanity or even everyone in a nation state, and we decided that we wanted to have another way of allocating the goods in society than using money, then money could be gone uh, tomorrow. And this sort of very fundamental difference between concepts like uh, natural concepts like air and oxygen and socially constructed um, things. That is really the, uh, the important uh, le uh, learning from the concept of uh, collective uh, imagin imaginaries. And as they are so different, one could even say that oxygen and money have different ontologies, to use a, a fancy word. So they are so fundamentally different. And because they are so fundamentally different, we also need different uh, ways of understanding them. We need different approaches to them. And of course, one of the problems with the science of, of e economy is that one, that science has for the last uh, 100 years been using natural science as a model. Uh, and I found it much more uh, useful as a financial entrepreneur to understand the market not as a natural phenomenon, trying to model it with natural science tool as the neoclassical uh, uh, economic thinking does, but rather look at the market as uh, a sociological phenomenon, as something that is uh, socially constructed. And as it is socially constructed, it can actually be um, reconstructed uh, by us humans. And, and that is a very, very fundamental insight. And is the, is the idea of the social imaginary more than just the market? Yeah, no, I mean, th this, this is everything. As I said, it's deeper uh, than is actually captured in the terms like zeitgeist or, or, uh, or I uh, ideology. Um, it's more close to the popular term, uh, the popular culture term, the matrix. That comes much, much closer to what we are uh, talking about. Um, the social imaginary is really uh, to us like water is to the fish. We can't see it, but we are totally dependent on it. So it's, it's really all our... Uh, uh, social myths, it's all our collective uh, values, it's our root uh, metaphors. And um, uh, we can't usually see this, but it is really when these social imaginaries become dysfunctional that we can start to capture a, a glimpse of them. So it's like the, the, the glitch in the matrix. It's through the glitch that we start to, uh, uh, to be aware of them, and especially when they are not serving our, our interests, either 
as individuals or, or collectively, when we sort of start to feel that there is this strong force in society that we don't know where it's coming from, but it's certainly not serving our interests, then it is prob probably the, um, uh, the organizing, the orche orchestrating power of the collective imaginary that we are feeling. And when the stress on the collective imaginary becomes too large, then like any, again, like any uh, self-organizing collective, uh, self-organizing complex system, then we have a phase shift. Then something quite rapidly changes. And the last time we had such a fundamental shift in, in the matrix, in the collective imaginary, that was during uh, the Enlightenment, when we went from a um, dogmatic religious uh, worldview into a uh, scientific uh, rational worldview. And we left such a, as ideas as, for example, the divine right of kings that really nobody questioned during the Middle Ages. And we got new myths instead, uh, like uh, the market myth or the myth of separation and the, and the number of these rote myths that we have that we cannot really see, but that something like the COVID crisis can start to make us um, conscious of. And especially this myth of, the sep of separation. Uh, I think the COVID crisis has made many of us wake up to, to the fact that we are much, much more interdependent than we, we usually th think we, we are. So in that way, the COVID crisis could be sort of a, a awakening up from, uh, from the collective imaginary that we are living in. Also, I should mention that the, the collective imaginary is um, really important. Uh, not only does it inform our sense making, but it also shapes what John Derweke is calling the, our salience landscape. So depending on our collective imaginary, different things becomes important to us. And we are using these root metaphors and these root myths of the collective imaginary to make sense of the world. But, but not only does the collective imaginary inform our sense making and our salience landscape, it also shapes our desires. And that is what uh, Daniel Schmachenberger point, pointed out uh, at the Rebel Wisdom Festival last weekend with a reference to René Girard. He said that desire is mimetic, meaning that we do not even sort of own our own desire. Our desire is dependent on our relationships and our collective imaginary. So these things are super important and Again, as they are uh, to us like water is to the fish, it really uh, demands an effort from us to start to see this collective imaginary. But once you have woken up to see it, then, then you start to see it um, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I could almost point at a point where I in a more embodied way, really became aware of this collective imaginary. And that was actually uh, uh, when I, a few years ago, together with my then 21-year-old son, Alexander, went to uh, Burning Man. And what got, got me interested in going to Burning Man was that I had many friends coming back from Burning Man, pointing out that they could not any longer look at this default reality with the same uh, naive eyes. Because there, of course, at Burning Man, you start from scratch and you build a completely, to, together you co-create a completely different collective imaginary out in the desert. And you live in that collective imaginary with uh, other values, without any money. And you, you actually see that for yourself that you can shift the collective imaginary and society is still functioning, but in a different way. So then when you come back to the default reality, you, you can't really 
see the world with the same naive eyes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good that uh, more and more people are waking up to, uh, to this concept and that we are not only rediscovering deep psychology, but that we are also a bit rediscovering uh, deep sociology. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple of thoughts that come to mind or questions that come to mind, one of which is, where do you think we're at in terms of the COVID crisis? And the other question is, do you think people are becoming more aware of the, the nature of a collective imaginary because of the COVID crisis, because so many things we thought were um, set in stone about the way we're living have shifted on a daily basis? Um, and if so, what, what relevance do you think that is? And do you think that's an opportunity to change? Yeah, Cert certainly. I think that um, the COVID crisis m makes um, more people wake up, not, not only to the myth of separation, but also starting to, to see the um, collective imaginary. The problem there is that we don't really have an everyday uh, or popular name for these things that... Uh, anthropologists and sociologists have been talking about for at least 50 years. Uh, and that is why I, uh, I'm trying to, to um, champion the collective imaginary, the, the term of uh, Gerard Bourjard as um, uh, a good name for this matrix. And I don't think that it's that we are perhaps waking up and all of a sudden that we see this collective imaginary, but we certainly get a feeling for that it's something, is, uh, something is wrong. And I think that that is what, what again, Charles Eisenstein was uh, trying to convey in his Medium article, that a lot of people feel that something is wrong. And then it's just so natural for us humans to uh, start to look at so... Why do I feel this um, orchestrating power that is making things happen in a direction in, in, in society? What is this? And then again, it's just so natural for us humans to then ascribe some human agency to that. And of course, sometimes there is a human agency behind, of course. But in many, many cases, these orchestrating power is, is actually the power of our unconscious social imaginary acting and making things happen. Uh, and again, when these things seem to not be um, helpful, then of course you start to, to question this. So uh, at least the COVID crisis is, is a starting point for bringing up uh, the issue of our collective imaginary and how, how important it is to start to see it but also to realize that it is a human construct and that we, we collectively can change it and that we, throughout history, collectively, unconsciously, most of the time, but sometimes consciously, have created it. So now it's time for us to be consciously aware of the collective imaginary and actually take responsibility for, for the collective imaginary. And... Again, you were asking that about postmodernism. Of course, this is actually a fundamentally postmodern insight that we have in society, these power structures, uh, and that we need to, to look carefully into these power structures. Where postmodernism goes, goes wrong sometimes, at least in its more extreme form, that is when uh, some postmodernists uh, philosophers claim that every aspect of the world is socially constructed. Even, for example, every single aspect of, of gender is socially constructed. And that even air and oxygen is socially constructed. No, of course not. You, you need to make a separation there and understand that, that sometimes you actually... Uh, uh, have to deal with, with nature and the constraints of nature as a starting point. And for, for, for example, we were, we were talking before about the, the fact that 
we feel as individuals that we are equally dependent on oxygen and money and that we can actually not do anything about oxygen or dependency on oxygen, but we can do um, anything we want about the fact that we are dependent on money. Sometimes I feel like we understand the, the, the world exactly the opposite way, that we somehow believe that the planetary boundaries are up for negotiation, but that the market forces, we just have to obey, obey. When of course it's, it's completely the opposite. And, and, and there the more extreme forms of postmodernist thinking has, has not been helpful. You really need to, to, to understand that we as humans are, are living in actually three worlds. And th this is something that many philosophers throughout history has been pointing out. Uh, ever since Plato, called Popper, certainly uh, Jürgen Habermas and, uh, and Ken Wilber, as, as you mentioned, they have all pointed out, and many others, that we as humans, we actually live in three worlds at the same time, where one is the natural world, the world of oxygen and gravitation. Uh, the next one is our inner world, the world of dreams and fantasies and values and meaning and, and, and purpose. And then the third world, that is the collective imaginary, the socially constructed world that, that has got its, its own ontology, something like between the natural world and, and, our, uh, and our inner world. And one of the big problems with, with the way that we have throughout history understood our human predicament has been that we have, during most times of history, been relying on one of these three perspectives too heavily. So, for example, during the last hundreds, hundreds of years uh, since the Enlightenment, the scientific worldview that is very strong when it comes to uh, investigating the, the natural world has so completely dominated uh, our understanding of, of the world that we are even trying, as I said before, to understand uh, the socially constructed market as a natural uh, phenomenon. Uh, and there, of course, uh, post postmodernism was a good critique of uh, our too much rely on us too much relying on, on, on the scientific perspective of the natural world. But then again, when postmodernist thinking goes too far, then, then you go wrong there as well. And then even in some spiritual traditions, there has been a focus on the inner world. And in some cases, uh, too much focus on the inner world, where you have perhaps the idea that the only thing that really matters, and perhaps the only thing that really exists, is your inner experience. But I would say no. That's not the case. S society is real and society is causing real suffering. So if you are only concentrating on the inner world, you are missing important aspects of the world. So in our complex sense making today, if, if I would give one recommendation, that would really be to try to start to see the world from at least these three different perspectives and understand that we need different tools to understand the natural aspects of the human world, the inner aspects of the human world, including our consciousness and consciousness development, our potential for consciousness development, and then the socially constructed world, our collective imaginary, and try to hold all of those perspectives there at the same time. And in all of the shifts, level three or deeper, we can really talk about that we are in a world between worlds in this shift. And John Verweck has, has pointed out that, that in shifts like that, um, we need new psychotechnologies to be able to develop new inner capacities. So I certainly think that that, that is something that we need to urgently look into now at the same time as we are prototyping and, and trying to support this fundamental system shift, 
that, that is going to be emergent. So uh, we will not be able to plan it. We will not be able to manage this shift, but we might be able to facilitate this shift happening because we shall remember that in these systems shifts, systems can go two ways. We can either have a, a step up in complexity and in elegance of organization, or we can have a breakdown. So when we reach one of these bifurcation points, we can either have a breakthrough or a breakdown. And as many as pointed out on, on, on your channel, uh, civilizations tend to break down. That's the normal development uh, for civilizations. The challenge right now is, of course, that, that our civilization this time is, uh, is global. Even when the Roman Empire collapsed, that, that, were, that was not a global collapse. That was a collapse of part of the globe. Uh, but if we have a civilizational collapse now, perhaps involving an environmental uh, disaster or a nuclear disaster or something, then, then it's really the whole world. So we can't re rely on the way that humanity has sort of managed these transitions before in a more or less uh, trial and error manner. Uh, so this, this time we have to somehow do this uh, consciously, even if we cannot planet, and even if we cannot even see uh, what the next civilization, so some people would call game B, what that, what that implementation might actually um, look like. But we can facilitate it. And again, I agree with John Vevek uh, that uh, trying and experimenting with different psychotechnologies that will help us develop new capacities to uh, to both see the world, but also to relate to ourselves, relate to each other, relate to society, and relate to nature in deeper ways. That I think is, a, is at least a requisite for a successful uh, transition. So I think that uh, in this transition that we are facing now, um, that we don't know how deep it will be. I certainly think it will be a, at least a level three tra transition and that we then again need to focus on inner development, developing the capacities to understand and to handle the world and to relate in, in deeper and more complex ways. And that that is not just something that a few people in some sort of intellectual elite need to do for this to shift to happen, a large part of the population actually needs to be able to hold this shift. So the question is, how can we do that today? And, and there I want to mention one initiative that my foundation is um, involved with, together with the Norsian Foundation in Sweden called 29K, 29k.org, uh, which is a digital platform where we are trying to see if we can successfully uh, uh, use a digital platform to replicate some of these uh, uh, facilitation techniques and interventions that we have been using at the Oak Island, at the Air Credit Retreat Center, and that has been used at retreat centers like SLN for, for more, than, more than 50 years. If we can try to uh, replicate that in a digital environment that is, of course, scalable in a completely different way than these in real life uh, retreats are. So I do think that real deep change, you do need the in real life experience, but you can certainly increase the interest and also do uh, some work uh, on, on a digital platform. We have to see how, how deep we will be able to, to go there. So far, the, what we have been trying there with, for example, these sharing circles um, through video sharing uh, has actually proven to, to work very, very well. And we, we can see uh, uh, deep shifts 
happening, uh, even on, on the level of what we see sometimes at uh, personal retreats. So uh, it's still early, but, but it, is, it is promising. Um, just before, I won't put this on, but is, are, the, are the courses at 29K, they're at low cost or are they free? No, so, so, uh, so 29K, uh, I, sh- I should mention, is a um, non-profit uh, organization. It's actually uh, its own foundation uh, that we have founded. So um, uh, 29K is completely free. It's non-profit. It is co-created and it is open source. And that is part of the dynamics of the platform that we want to invite researchers and uh, practitioners from all over the world to be able to upload interventions and then to do research on how these interventions are working on different target audiences uh, where people are at different stages in, in, their, in their life. And for people to feel comfortable to share their data, um, it is comforting that we are a nonprofit and that we promise never to uh, monetize any uh, data that we are collecting on the site. Thank you, Thomas. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching. See you soon.